<laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Francesca Simon and I'm really thrilled to be here today with you all in Kentish Town and virtually around the UK. So can everybody here just turn around and wave at the camera and say hello, hello, fabulous, because we're sort of welcoming a big audience. I am so thrilled to be here today. I write the Horrid Henry books, as some of you know. But I'm especially excited because today is the first day that I've ever seen my brand new Horrid Henry book, which is Horrid Henry's Cannibal Curse. And I want to talk to you today about how I get ideas, how I got the ideas for Horrid Henry, and then you are going to be the first children in the entire world to hear the brand new Horrid Henry story, Horrid Henry's Cannibal Curse. It will be the first time that I will have read the story from the actual Horrid Henry book. Well, first of all, as I said, I write the Horrid Henry books. How many people here like to write stories? Yes, I like to see that. How many people here like to draw the pictures for their stories? Loads of you, that is brilliant. Well, I have to tell you, I am not a very good artist. But the good thing about being a bad artist is that I get the amazing and brilliant Tony Ross, who draws all the pictures for Horrid Henry. So I write the words, and then Tony really brings them to life with his wonderful illustrations. Now, the question that I get asked the most in the whole world, and we've been gathering questions in from our virtual audience as well, is... Where do you get your ideas? How do you get your ideas? Where do your ideas come from? And I get my ideas the way you all get your ideas. For example, how many people here, when they've been told to write a story, get an idea from something they've dreamt? Raise your hands if you've ever written a story about something that you've dreamt. A lot of you. How about a story, did you get an idea for a story about something that happened to you in real life? Yep, more of you. How many people got an idea for a story based on something they read or something they saw on TV? Loads of you. How many people have got an idea for a story and they have no idea where the idea came from? It just kind of popped into their head. These are all ways that I have got my ideas. And I work, I actually live in North London, but I work at home in my office, and that's the one place I never get an idea. I get ideas when I'm out walking the dog, or at the supermarket, or on my bicycle, or someone will say something, or I'll think about something funny that happened to me. And the way I got the idea for Horrid Henry so many years ago was I, well, I have to backtrack. I'm the eldest of four children. And I know a lot about what it's like being an eldest child. How many people here are eldest children? Yes. How many people here have to suffer from having younger brothers and sisters who annoy them and take their things and invade their room? A lot of you. All right. I'm going to be fair. How many people here are younger children and have to be bossed around by mean, horrible, older brothers and sisters? Now, do I seem like someone who was bossy? Yes. Mm. Um, my sister, I have, my sister and my brother said I was really bossy, that I was so mean and bossy. Maybe, maybe. But um, I really know what it's like because we always lived in very small houses and I always had to share really tiny rooms with my sister and she was always taking my things. So part of me when I grew up always remembers what that was like having... A, you know, a sister that I had to share with who I didn't really get on with. She liked to go to bed really early. I liked to stay up late. It was hard. So I also love reading comic books. And I've never met a children's author who didn't love reading comic books. So I'm an eldest sibling. Sis I'm an older sister. I have lots of stories about when I was younger. And I was on the phone to somebody, uh, a friend, and she said, um, why don't you write a story about somebody horrid? And I went, well, Henry was horrid. And it was as simple as that. And because I used horrid, Hen horrid Henry 
because there's lots of alliteration. I'm sure you all know what alliteration is. What is alliteration? Go on. That is the most perfect definition of alliteration. Well done. So alliteration, when you have the two, letter, the two words and they both start with the same letter. So H, H, Horrid Henry. How about M, M? Who's that? You can shout it out. How about, let's say, P, P? Who could that be? How about B, B? Who could that be? Boudica, B beefy bird, and also Boudica, battle axe, the horrible teacher. Well, I love alliteration, and one of the ways that I get my horrid Henry names is I take an adjective like rude or sour or horrid or perfect, and, and then I put a name to it. So that's how I get my horrid Henry names, is just thinking about terrible, terrible adjectives. But, so when I was, got the idea of writing a story about horrid Henry, I thought, well, he needs to have somebody else. He can't just be horrid all by himself. He needs somebody to contrast. I thought, well, if I've got a character who's horrid, it would be very nice to have somebody else who was perfect. So I thought, well, perfect Peter. So in this case, I had my two characters um, formed, Horrid Henry, Perfect Peter. And then the way that I write stories is I get my characters, and then I, I listen to them. And I put them in different situations, and then I see what they do and what they say and how they react. And the stories just grew from there. It was originally just one story called Horrid Henry. It was called Horrid Henry's Perfect Day, about the day that he decided to try to be perfect. And then I tried to write a couple more and a couple more. And so it slowly, slowly grew, because now there are, this is the 24th Horrid Henry book. And I've written 96 Horrid Henry stories. But when I started, I never, ever thought I would write so many stories. So let me just tell you a little bit about the ideas behind some of your favorite Horrid Henry stories. For example, how many of you know the story of Horrid Henry in the comfy black chair? That's the story where Horrid Henry and his brother fight over who gets to control the TV remote. And my niece and nephew had a comfy black chair, and they also fought a lot. So I thought that was very funny because their house rule was whoever was sitting in the comfy black chair got to control the TV. So they used to push each other off the chair and say, right, I'm in charge. Or they'd say, you know, David, mom's calling. And David would trot off and then his sister would jump into the chair. So they used to play tricks on each other all the time. So that one was absolutely from my niece and nephew. A lot of, some of the stories are based around my son, Josh, who's not Horrid Henry. He's now all grown up. But Joshua was um, a vegetarian, well, he still is vegetarian, but he was a vegetarian who basically hated vegetables, which was very difficult. Um, so I wrote, when I wrote the story, Horrid Henry Eats a Vegetable, that was inspired by him, or Horrid Henry Tricks the Tooth Fairy, because he was very, he was the youngest in his class, and he hadn't lost a tooth, and he was so sad because everybody else had. So... I often take little ideas and then I'd say, what would Henry do? What would Peter do? So let me just tell you a little bit about the background to the story of Horrid Henry's Cannibal Curse. And this actually is based on something that happened to me. And what happened was I have these much older cousins. They, are teenage. they were teenagers and I was about six or seven. And I was quite noisy, and I was always running around. I was staying with them, and I was running around the house yelling, and they got really fed up with me. So they called me into their room, and they said, look up at the ceiling. And I looked up, and there were these dangling heads. They said, see those heads? Those were our other cousins. They made so much noise, we shrank their heads. And I'm just getting shivers. Just thinking, I was terrified, and I believed them. 
and I got really scared that they could shrink heads. And then they told me that it wasn't true, but why didn't we play a trick on my sister, who was younger, and tell her about the, cannibal, about the heads? I thought, yes, great idea, let's go scare her. So I was reminded of this story, and I thought, this is a perfect Horrid Henry event, where Horrid Henry would try to trick Peter. And the other stories in this book, the first one is Horrid Henry's Bake Off, and no, no prizes for guessing how I got the idea, because I love the Great British Bake Off, and I thought, well, Henry does like to bake. So this is his attempt to make a chocolate cake and beat Margaret. And the other story um, is called Horrid Henry's Bad Book, where Horrid Henry is in love with some books, the Evil Evie books. And his parents think the books are making him behave badly, so they ban them. And it's about how Henry tries to get the books back. But now I am going to read Horrid Henry's Cannibal Curse. So you can see how I took something that really happened and turned it into a story. So I've changed it a bit. It's, it's not cousins. You'll see, it'll be interesting now that you know the truth behind how I got the idea. Now you can hear me read it and see the bits that I've used that are true and the bits that I've made up, because that's how people write stories. So is everybody ready to listen? Yeah. First time in the whole entire world, it's time for Horrid Henry's Cannibal Curse. It was the weekend. Yippee! No school, no school dinners, no Miss Battleaxe, and best of all, no homework. It was the weekend. Boo! Hiss, yuck. The weekend meant chores. His mean, horrible parents weren't happy with torturing him by sending him to school five days a week and then making him live with wormy worm Peter the rest of the time. Oh, no. They had to make him suffer as their slave as well. Did they have any idea how much time doing chores took? How much wonderful telly he missed trudging up and down the stairs, emptying all the waste paper baskets, and cleaning out Fluffy's litter tray and putting the recycling outside. Horrid Henry had lost hours, months, years of his life. It was so unfair. One day, one happy day, he would find a way to get out of this weekly misery. One day he'd find a slave of his own he could boss around. Perfect Peter bounced into the sitting room. Go away, said Horrid Henry. What are you doing, Henry? asked Peter. I'm going to alphabetize my books. What does it look like I'm doing, poopsicle? said Henry, stretching out on the sofa. If only he didn't have to move. I'm not a poopsicle, said Peter. Horrid Henry looked at Peter the poopsicle. <laughs> and then Horrid Henry had a brilliant, wonderful, spectacular idea. Why, oh, why hadn't he thought of this before? It's sad you're such a baby, said Henry. I am not a baby, said Peter. I'm a big boy. Do you really think you're as good as me, said Henry, that anything I can do, you can do? Yes, said Peter. No way, Ugalina, said Henry. You're a baby. I am not, said Peter, and don't call me Ugalina. <laughs> then I dare you to run upstairs and collect all the recycling, said Horrid Henry. Bet you can't do it by the time I count to 25. Can too, said Peter. Then prove it, baby boo-boo, said Henry. <laughs> if you can, you'll never be a baby boo-boo again. Perfect Peter grabbed a rubbish bag and dashed upstairs. Horrid Henry leaned back on the sofa and counted loudly. Dee -dee. What a brilliant way to get Peter to do his chores. Peter dashed downstairs, gasping for breath, clutching a full bag. Nineteen, twenty. Peter, you did it, said Henry. You're king of the rubbish. <laughs> Perfect Peter was delighted. It wasn't often that Henry praised him. I knew I could do it, said Peter, trying to stop panting. 
He'd never run so fast in his life. Wow, said Henry, you really proved me wrong. Peter glowed. Finally, finally, Henry was recognizing how clever he was. And no more being called Baby Boo Boo. That was amazing, said Henry. Now, let's see how fast you can clean out Fluffy's litter tray. My best time is 54 seconds. I'll start counting now. One, two, three. Perfect Peter raced to Fluffy's stinky litter box by the kitchen back door. He'd show Henry how fast he was. Henry would never be able to call him a nappy baby wibble pants again. <laughs> Peter grabbed the poop scoop. Then he stopped. A terrible thought dribbled into his brain. Was it possible? Was Henry tricking him? Tricking him into doing his chores? Had he fallen for Henry's tricks again? Perfect Peter smelled a rat. No, no, no! Mom wailed Peter. Henry tricked me into doing his chores. Uh-oh, thought Henry. Don't be horrid, Henry shouted Mom. Do your own chores or no TV for a week. Telltale, hissed Henry. How could he have serves you right, Henry, said Peter. How could he have thought Henry was being nice to him for once? He swore he'd never fall for one of Henry's tricks ever again. Peter glared at Henry. Henry smiled at Peter. I've written a song for you, Peter, said horrid Henry. He jumped on the sofa and began to sing. Oh, I'm a big fat ninny, a skinny mini ninny. I'm a strudel noodle tart, and all I do is fall. Mom, screamed Peter. Henry called me a ninny and a strudel noodle. <laughs> Did not, said Horrid Henry. I was just singing a song. That's it, Henry, said Mom. No pocket money for a week. No pocket money? And all because of his wormy worm brother? But I wasn't doing anything, howled Henry. Is it a crime to sing a song in this house? <laughs> Ding dong. It was Rude Ralph come over to play. He was holding a lumpy plastic bag. They went up to Henry's bedroom. No worms allowed, said Henry, slamming the door. He had to pay Peter back for getting him into trouble singing. It was so unfair. What's in the bag, said Horrid Henry. Shrunken heads, said Rude Ralph. Ooh, said Henry. Ralph pulled two hideous skull heads from the bag. They had big, empty eye sockets and scary wisps of long, straggly, blonde and brown hair. They looked, they looked absolutely marvelous. Wow, said Henry. Wow. He reached out and touched the gruesome skulls. He wanted those heads more than anything in the world. Where'd you get them? Present from my grand, said Ralph. These two are for you. Thanks, Ralph, said Henry. Did anyone ever have a better friend than Ralph? This one looks like Margaret, said Horrid Henry, swinging one of the heads by its ponytail. <clears throat> Just better looking, said Ralph rudely. Henry and Ralph hung up the heads from the ceiling light. Yeah, the heads looked really horrible. Horrid Henry shivered. Ralph grabbed hold of Henry's metal headband from his evil scientist robot kit and shoved it on top of his hair. Ooh, ah, ee, my head is shrinking, yelped Ralph, writhing in his chair and laughing. Horrid Henry stared at Ralph. He just had the most brilliant idea ever in the history of the universe. If he could make Peter believe he could shrink heads, Peter would be in his power. He could make Peter give him all his crisps. He could get Peter's pocket money. He'd never have to steal Peter's chips again. Peter would just hand them over or else. He would rule the house as King Henry the Horrible forever. Peter! bellowed Henry. Come quick! I have a present for you. Perfect Peter poked his head round the door. What, said Peter. Who do you want, asked Henry. Margaret or Susan? Huh? Up there, said Horrid Henry, pointing. Perfect Peter stared at the skulls dangling from the ceiling lamp. One had a dark ponytail. The other had a few blonde tufts. What are they, said Peter cautiously. Margaret and Susan, said Horrid Henry, they've annoyed me for the very last time. I shrank their heads. Shame you missed it, said Rude Ralph. 
Perfect Peter stared up at the shrunken heads. No way. Absolutely no way. I don't believe you, said Peter. He took a step back. I know an ancient cannibal curse, said Henry, from my top secret curse book. When I say the curse with the help of my trusty head shrinker, pow! Perfect Peter recoiled. He knew Henry was lying. Henry had to be lying. Henry couldn't really shrink heads, could he? You're lying, said Peter. I'll prove it, said Henry. If you're so sure I'm lying, then put on the head shrinker and we'll find out. He held up the metal hand, headband. All you have to lose is your head. No, said Peter. Why not, said Horrid Henry. You'll change history. Headless statues will be raised to you everywhere. Ooh, thought Peter. A headless statue of me. Wait a minute. I don't want to be a shrunken head, said Peter. He edged away towards the door. Rude Ralph stepped forward. I'll volunteer, he said. Are you sure, said Henry? Yes, said Ralph. You need proof of your great invention. Just, just call it the Ralph. I promise, said Horrid Henry. Thank you, Ralph. It's been great knowing you. Henry placed the metal shrinker over Ralph's head. Perfect Peter watched, horrified, as Henry slowly tightened the screws. And now I will begin the head shrink curse, said Horrid Henry. He bowed his head and raised his arms to the ceiling. Oh, mighty head shrinkers from the past, Unganunu and Alidocious Mimimotious, gather round and have a blast. Rude Ralph began to shudder and shake. Henry carried on. You have your flesh, O oh Unga. You have your power, O oh Alidocious. You have your magic, O oh spirits. Take this head, squeeze it tight. Kookaboo, kookaboo, kookaboo. Rude Ralph gave a blood curdling scream. Perfect Peter yelped and ran out of the room. Mom, help, wailed Peter. Henry's shrinking Ralph's head. Henry and Ralph choked with laughter. Henry, get down here this minute, shouted Mom, you horrid boy. Horrid Henry rolled his eyes. I'll be right back, he said to Ralph, heading downstairs. Henry said he'd shrunk Margaret's and Susan's heads, whimpered Peter. And now he's shrinking Ralph's. Henry, that's a horrible trick to play on Peter, said Mom. It wasn't a trick, said Henry. I was just doing a science experiment. Henry, why can't you play nicely with your brother, said Mom. I was playing nicely, said Henry. I even offered to give Peter one of my shrunken heads as a present. And then Horrid Henry heard a piercing voice coming from next door's garden. It's hard being the most popular girl in the class. Everyone wants to be my friend, brayed Moody Margaret. You aren't the most popular girl, yelled Susan sourly. Everyone thinks you're a mean old bossy boots. Perfect Peter gasped. You said you'd shrunk their heads, he said. You lied. I did shrink their heads, said Henry. And then I unshrunk them. Mum sighed. Henry, I want you to leave Peter alone. Horrid Henry stared at his feet. Yes, Mum. Tra la la. He'd got off lightly thanks to his weasel words. Henry dashed back upstairs and burst into his bedroom. Ralph, I got away with it. No punishment for me. Horrid Henry looked round. No Ralph. Ralph, said Henry. On the chair where Ralph had been sitting was the head shrinker. Inside the shrinker was a shrunken head. Ralph had vanished. Ralph, said Henry. That was odd. Ralph, you in the loo? Henry looked. No Ralph. He checked under his bed. No Ralph. Slowly, Horrid Henry approached the chair. The skull had brown hair, just like Ralph's. Ralph, stop fooling around, said Horrid Henry. His heart began to pound. Was Ralph gone? What had he done? What would he do? Na 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 na! Yelped Ralph, leaping out of the wardrobe. Tricked you! Ah!
And that is the end. I really had hid in the closet, in the wardrobe, and I was waiting to leap out at my sister when my mother came in and got really mad. Anyway, now we're going to take some questions. So we're going to take questions both from you. So put your hands up if you have a question. And we're also going to take questions from our virtual audience who sent some really wonderful ones in earlier. So, right. So only speak if you have the microphone. Go ahead. And what gave you the inspiration to write Horrid Henry books? What gave me the inspiration to write Horrid Henry books? Well, I wanted to write about families where there was a good child and a bad child, because it's something I think that everybody knows in their family, if they're the good one or the bad one. And I was just really interested that families seem to divide like this. And also, I love writing. Okay. Why did you call it the Cannibal Curse? Why did I call it the Cannibal Curse? Because um, I wanted a really scary title, and also because Henry tells Peter that he can shrink heads and that he can that he's a can he has an old cannibal curse. So it was really just for fun. What was the best book you've wrote? What's the best book I've ever written? I am. I'm afraid I'm really fickle, and I always like my newest book first. So I think Cannibal Curse is the funniest and the best book I've written. And now I'm going to take a question from our virtual audience. I really like this one. The question was, is Dennis the Menace Horrid Henry's dad? And that's from Anwar Saeed from Ray Lodge Primary School. And that is a great question because, well, one of the reasons is, because Dennis the Menace is about 70 years old, but Henry has loads of, you could say, fathers and mothers. Dennis the Menace, Just William, Pippi Longstocking, Peter Pan. There's such a big tradition of, of children who are very individual and who speak up and who are just never beaten down. But I would say Dennis probably is, is a father to Horrid Henry, so I, I really thought that was a good question. Go ahead. How long have you been writing books? Writing books. How long have I been writing books? Well, I started writing when I was eight years old, so you are never too young to start writing. The secret is keep a notebook, write your stories down, and finish them. That's the biggest thing. But I wasn't published till I was in my 30s, and I've written over 50 books. Go ahead. How long did it take you to write The Cannibal Curse? It usually takes me about four months to write a Horrid Henry story, because it takes me a long time to think of the funny twists um, and to get the ideas for them. Once I write, I write pretty fast, but then I, I write them, I rewrite them, I change them, I cut them, I throw them out, I start again. And now I'm going to take another question from our virtual audience. And this one is from Andrea from Chester Le Street Church of England Primary School. If Henry became a teacher when he left school, what subject do you think he would teach best? Well, I think he would teach lunch the best. But um, I like that question because one of the ideas I had, I was inspired by a teacher once who told me something he had done when he was a boy, and then he grew up to be a teacher, which is in the book Horde Henry's Revenge, where he tells Perfect Peter they're fairies at the bottom of the garden, and he makes, and then he l makes Peter climb a tree and then leaves him out all night. This boy did that and then grew up and became a teacher and conveniently forgot that he had done this. So if you're watching, Wilf, you're spotted. OK, next. What was your favorite book that you wrote? My favorite book, well, I mean, my favorite Horrid Henry book, I've told you, is probably Horrid Henry's Cannibal Curse. And my favorite book for older children is called The Lost Gods. And that's because I love mythology. And so this is a book about the Norse gods coming down to our world and trying to get loads of worshipers and fans. So it was a really fun way for me to write about my interest in mythology. And that one is for older children. That's good. What inspired you to make the Horrid Henry Tricks, the Tooth Fairy? What inspired me to write Horrid Henry Tricks, the Tooth Fairy was, as I mentioned, my son Josh was always the youngest in his class. And um, he hadn't lost a tooth, and everybody else in his class had, and he was really upset about it. 
So when things like that happen, I often think, what would Henry do? And I think, well, what about if Henry hadn't lost a tooth? He would try to trick the tooth fairy. So it was more, I asked myself questions like that, and then think about, take an ordinary situation and then give it a horrid twist. Who encouraged you to write more horrid Henry stories? Who encouraged me to write more horrid Henry stories? Well, I encouraged myself, really, because they're really popular and they're really fun to write. Um, because Henry always has a snappy answer, which I like, because none of us ever do. Like, you know, when Peter says, you told me you'd shrunk their heads, if it was me, I'd go, oh, oh, yeah, I did, oh, uh. Oh. And he just goes, yeah, and then I unshrunk them. So I love that he always has a fun answer. And now um, a question from Libby from Fallow Park Primary School, who wanted to know, as a child, was I more like perfect Peter or horrid Henry? Now, I think everybody in the whole world is a mixture of horrid Henry and perfect Peter. So I was perfect Peter in school. I never spoke out without raising my hand. I always did my homework. Every teacher loved me the moment I got home. I was slamming the doors, screaming, yelling. I hate you, go away. That was me, so I was both. But everybody is a kind of mix of both of them. Um, what will Horrid Henry be when he grows up? What will Horrid Henry be? What do you think Horrid Henry would be when he grows up? Well, I, um, I probably think he should be a chef. Oh, you know, that is a great choice. I think he'd actually love to be a chef. That's a fabulous suggestion. I, never, I can't imagine Henry grown up. I absolutely can't imagine him. But now when I get asked that question, I'm going to say a chef. That's the perfect answer, thank you. Go ahead. What made you want to be an author? What made me want to be an author? Um, because I love to read. And I hope every single person in this room loves books and loves to read. I used to read two books a day. I hoovered books. I read everything. I love books so much that I always used to smell the books and I would open the book and smell it, and what would happen is the ink was always a little bit wet, so I used to have a blue face a lot of the time, because I was always smelling my books. So being a big reader is the best way to become a writer, but I've always, been re I've always liked words, I've always been really comfortable around words, and I love telling stories. So another question, this is a very good one. Linda from the, li from the Library of Birmingham, the children's library there, wants to know, would Horrid Henry join his local library and return his books on time? Well, the answer to the first part of that question is yes, of course he's joined his local library because Henry actually really likes reading, but he likes reading his kind of books. His favorite books are written by T.J. Fizz, books like Skeleton Skunk, but his other favorite books in Horrid Henry's Cannibal Curse, the last story, Horrid Henry's Bad Book, He's obsessed with the evil Evie books. So he goes to the library to try to check them out, and they're all gone because they're so popular. Would he return his books on time? Mm, not so sure. But he definitely is a member of his local library. Yes? How old was you when you started writing Horrid Henry books? How old was I when I started writing Horrid Henry books? About two. Um, no, I was um, in my early 30s when I started writing them. I started writing them, and my son was born in about three years afterwards, so he was about three years old when I started writing them. So he was much too young for Horrid Henry when I started. Who's your favorite character? Oh gosh, that's a hard question. Who's my favorite character? Um, I mean, I actually quite like Perfect Peter because everybody, no one likes him, so I feel a bit sorry for him. The character, a character I really like is Beefy Bert. Because all Beefy Bird ever says is, I love that. And I discovered, which I hadn't realized, that my brothers always used to say that. I'd forgotten it. But whenever you ask them a question like, you know, do you want to go out now? I don't know. Do you want to, do you want to, what do you want, what do you want for dinner? I don't know. And that I had, without realizing it, put them, so I really have fun thinking up silly questions like, Bert, what's your dog's name? I don't know. 
um, <laughs> that he won't, that he just won't answer. And I like Boudicca Battle Axe as well. Go ahead. What's your favorite book other than the Horace Henry books? My favorite book that I've written or that somebody else has written? That somebody else has written. Oh, um, my favorite, well, my favorite children's book is probably Tom's Midnight Garden, um, which I completely love by Philippa Pierce. Um, my favorite adult books are written by Anthony Trollope, who lived in the 19th century, and all his books are about that fat, and he wrote 47 of them. That's, I love Victorian novels. Yeah. If you weren't an author, what would you be? Um, well, in my dreams, like Miss Battleax, I'd be a tap dancer. Um, I would probably be a journalist, which is what I was, a journalist that write for newspapers, which is what I used to do um, before I became uh, a children's author. I might be a teacher, any of those things. A chorus girl, possibly. <laughs> um, and um, a good question from Mark from uh, Mount Nicole Street School, sorry, is what has been your favorite part of the series, and what do you intend to do to write next? Um, I think my favorite bit is all the tricks that Henry plays on Peter. Thinking of tricks, tricks that I played, I gather stories from other children about tricks that have been played. And um, what I'm writing next is I've written a book for teenagers called The Monstrous Child. And I am hoping to develop that further. But again, in, in my book of Norse stories, and, Hel, and it's about the goddess Hel, who's the Norse goddess of the underworld, who is half human and half corpse. That's why she's the goddess of the dead. Yes, go ahead. How many books you write? How many books have I written? I have written, I've lost count, but it's over 50. There are 24 Horrid Henry big story books, then there's loads of smaller ones. What was your first ever Horrid Henry book? Oh, my fir oh, I wish I had that here. My first ever Horrid Henry book was called, amazingly, Horrid Henry. Um, and uh, yeah, that was, that was it, because I never knew that I was going to write more. So I just called it Horrid Henry. And um, a question from our virtual audience is, which is your favorite book cover for your books? And I have to say, I think this is a great book cover. I absolutely love it. I love that it's shiny. I love those funny skeletons. So I'm really thrilled with this one. And of course, today is the first day I've ever seen it. Okay, okay. next question. If, if you wrote another book uh, and you had a new character, what would you call, call him or her? Ah, new character. Um, well, let me think. I mean, there's always a new character in every book. And so Evil Evie is the new character in the latest Horrid Henry. Um, I always try to feed, feed one in. I mean, I, my, the newest ones have been Stone Age Stephen, Evil Evie. Do you have a favorite character? Sorry? What's, who's your favorite character? Is, Rude Ralph, lots of people like Rude Ralph. In fact, that's one reason I used him more because so many children said they loved Rude Ralph. Go ahead. Why didn't you give Horrid Henry a sister? Why didn't I give Horrid Henry a sister? That's an excellent question. Um, well, I have one son, so I tend to think of boys. And I also remember, I only thought I was writing one story. I wasn't thinking I'd be writing 96 of them. So I just thought, Horrid Henry, Perfect Peter, the first name that came into my head was Peter. So I, I'm afraid I didn't give it any thought at all. It was a 10 second decision. I didn't know I'd be left with it for 20 years. Go ahead. What was your best movie you've ever seen? What was the best movie I've ever seen? Well, I think my favorite movie is a movie called Singing in the Rain. It's probably my absolute favorite. That is probably the best movie I've ever seen, and I've seen it a billion times. Um, another question. 
from Jan from Sundridge Primary School is, what advice would you give to new authors inspired by your writing? My main advice is to keep an ideas notebook. Write down your ideas. Finish your stories. And the other really good tip I can give you, because I've been a judge on 500 words, where over 100,000 children sent in stories, but to think about how your story is different at the end from the beginning, that's often a really good tip. And another tip is sometimes to write the end first. You're always taught in schools to write beginning, middle, end. There is no law that says you have to do this. You can write end, beginning, middle if you prefer. Or, like I do, beginning, end, and then the middle. And the middle is the twist, how your characters got from how they were at the beginning to how they are at the end. Go ahead. What sort of other books do you write? What sort of other books do I write? Um, I write, as I showed you, um, my Norse books. So these are for older children, The Lost Gods. I've done another one called The Sleeping Army. Um, I write picture books. Um, my other picture book, my most recent one, is called uh, Do You Speak English, Moon? Um, but the main books I write are Horrid Henry and my Norse, my Norse series for older children, because I do like mythology a lot. How much time do you spend writing in your office? How much time do I spend writing in my office? That's a kind of a hard question because part of my mind is always working. I always have notebooks with me, but several hours every day because if I'm not writing a new story, I'm looking at reading finished ones, changing them, and then the way the stories happen is my publisher, Orion, will send me Tony Ross's pictures, and then we look and see how the words and the pictures work together and see if they're in the right spot. I don't know about you, but I really hate reading books where the picture gives away what's going to be happening two pages later. So you have to make sure the pictures are in the right place, um, make sure that all the full stops are in, that I haven't misspelt a word. So there's lots of things associated with writing books as well. Okay. How long does it take you to write books? Well, it depends how long a book. I mean, for a Horrid Henry, like I said, is, is four months. This book, uh, The Lost Gods, took me over a year to write. Um, it takes a really long time because don't forget, it's not just writing the book. You're writing it, you're rewriting it, you're changing it. You want to make every word count. And um, we're going to go for one final question, um, which is, um, out of all the books you've written, what is your favorite? And that's from Emily from St. Andrew's Junior School. And you know, I have a lot of favorites. I've, I've told you my favorite Horrid Henry book, but my favorite Horrid Henry story is probably Horrid Henry Gets Rich Quick, where he sells, he wants to make some money in a jumble sale, so he sells Perfect Peter. <laughs> Yay, as jumble. And um, my favorite other book is, pro is uh, The Lost Gods. So, thank, oh, we've got one final question, yes. Why did you stop writing Horrid Henry books? Why did I stop writing Horrid Henry books? Well. I've written 96 stories. That's a lot of stories. And I wanted to stop writing them while the stories are still really good. I would really hate it if people read the last. I want people to read the last Horrid Henry book and go, this is the best Horrid Henry book I've ever read. And I think I just, I've always only done one a year because I want them to always be wonderful, to be really, really good. And I just thought it was time to stop while the stories were still really, really good. So it's now time to say goodbye. Can we all turn to the camera and say goodbye to everybody who's been watching with us? Goodbye and thank you all. <laughs>